We continue this week with uh, truth, right? The, the whole Lenten theme this year has been about truth, even when the truth is uncomfortable. For we hear Jesus say that the truth will set us free, and we believe this, but the promise is not that truth will make us comfortable. Sometimes the truth is a bit of a challenge. And so today we are talking about a rather challenging topic, uh, talking about abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse. Now, as you may have noticed, I, I tend to start the sermon with a story on myself or something like that. Um, I have no story to tell about this, right? There are stories I could tell, but they're not my stories to tell. And so I think what I can say is that uh, this topic, abuse, has impacted the people I love, right? It, it matters. This, this is of significance to me greatly. Um, we can look at nationwide statistics, 683,000 children abused in 2015. I can tell you that one in six women will endure some sort of uh, attempted sexual assault or sexual assault in their lifetime. Um, but those are national numbers, and what is very easy to do is to say, well, that's not around here, is it? Well, I made some phone calls, and I talked to, uh, I, I got the numbers on, on, in 2018, there were 18 substantiated cases of child abuse in Shelby County. There were 136 children that were hotlined. Um, so it is here. Like in uh, Shelby County, we have uh, this area is served by a domestic violence shelter called Avenues. And I called Avenues and I said, well, what do you see? T tell me. Right? And, and I was told, um, they, in 2017, they had 59 cases. In 2018, they had 45 and for this county. And thus far in 2019, there have been 18 cases of domestic abuse that have led to calls to avenues right here in, in Shelby County. And so this is a matter that is not just of national uh, importance, but is a matter of local importance too. These are our neighbors. It really is here. And so we're going to talk about this today, and we're going to start by looking at what Scripture lays out. Scripture is pretty clear. There's, a, there's this phrase, if you read the Old Testament, you're going to catch this phrase, about establishing justice in the gate. Right? This is the phrase that comes up again and again from Exodus, uh, here, what we just read at the very beginning of Scripture. Do not take a bribe. Do not sub subvert the cause of the just. I will not quit the guilty. Right? This idea of making sure justice is served, and that's the phrase, justice in the gate. And, and the terminology refers to in, in uh, towns, rural communities of, of first century and earlier Israel. The gate of the town is where all the business was transacted, because that's when, where goods would come into town. And, and so that was also where judgments were decreed, uh, where problems were resolved. And so to have justice in the gate was to have uh, the gate, the place where people went to get help, people set, went to say, I have a problem, to make sure that those whose voices are the most easy to overlook, most vo voices who are most easy to ignore, those voices are heard. Is what, that's what it means to have justice in the gate. So it's the, it's from the very beginning in Scripture, in Exodus, and Isaiah, we read about, uh, woe to those who mess with the innocent or declare falsely in the gate, Isaiah 29, or, or Amos 5, God is paying attention to those who are without voice, those who are ignored, those who are not getting justice as they ought to get. Jesus talks about this, and it's one of the most striking images Jesus used is that um, you mess with one of the children, you're better off to tie a millstone around your neck and jump off a cliff. Right? That, that, that's about as striking as it gets. And uh, millstones, those suckers are big. Right? This is not, you're not going to make it if you do that. And it would be better to do that than mess with one of the, these, uh, one of the ones who are weak, one of the ones whose voices are ignored. Uh, Jesus says at, near the end of Matthew 25, As you have done to the least, you have done unto me. As you have treated those who need the most help, that's how you have treated Jesus. You can't love Jesus if you don't love the people who Jesus pays the most attention to, the ones who need the most help. And so as I read this, like, I don't think I've said anything controversial yet. Like, there's no one who's saying, no, Amy, we really, we really do need to beat kids. Like, there's no one here who's disagreeing with me on this. I'm, I'm, <laughs> if you do, let me know. But like, this is not controversial. And, and yet when I talk to the lady at Avenues, who is the, here, th this area, I ask, like, what's your challenge? Like, what, what's the challenge around here? And she tells me that the biggest challenge around here it's getting people to believe that it could really happen here. 
Jesus talks about, uh, he says it's in uh, Matthew 10. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Yes, there are wolves out there. Therefore be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. This sermon is an exercise in, in becoming as shrewd as serpents. Paying attention to what might happen so that we can respond, right? And it starts with this moment of being honest with ourselves that it is just far more comfortable to not. It's far more comfortable to see no evil and speak no evil and just not pay attention. But I think it's part of taking the call to love our neighbor seriously. And so let's look at this. First, uh, child abuse. It does happen. Neglect is the most common form. 75% of cases of child abuse are just neglect, right? Someone not, they're just being ignored. Right? And, and after that, the other 25% make up the uh, physical, sexual, psychological, uh, medical abuse in descending order of occurrence. It is very hard to find trends about what type of family in which this happens. Like, I wish I could say, you know, just look for this type of family, and that's where you're going to find it. Sorry, not that easy, right? It happens in whatever family it happens. And so there's no easy answer there. And, and if you go looking up lists of signs for child abuse, page after page after page of depressing things could happen, right? Uh, bedwetting, excessive crying, anxiety, fear, depression, withdrawal from touch, weird injuries, burns, or bruises. What it seems to me as I, as I go wade through these lists is that you pay attention to a child such that when something weird happens, you notice. Uh, I know a teacher, this has been years now, I know a teacher, years, years ago, I know a teacher who noticed a child starting to stutter. The child had never stuttered before. The child started to stutter. And, and that was the sign. They went to uh, the other people in the school and they, they, they made a phone call and it got investigated and that stuttering was the sign that that child had begun to be abused. And, and so it's not, I can't give you one thing to look for. What I can say is pay attention to children and if something out of the ordinary, something weird such as happening that doesn't make sense to you, ask. Ask, are you okay? And then listen. It is very tempting to start asking questions, and, and, but if you ask a child, are you okay, what are they going to do? Talk. Right? And if you start asking questions, you might lead them on. I, I was reading of um, a situation in which a child accused someone of abuse, and, and, um, and the, the person who was asking the questions could have led them on through that. Well, how did he touch you? Like, no, no, you just listen. And if someone ever asks, can you keep a secret? The answer is, I cannot keep a secret if I'm worried about you being safe. And if you ever find that in your, that yourself in that situation, you come find me and we'll figure out what to do next. Right? But if it does happen, I've called the child abuse hotline before. I'm fairly certain I'm going to have to do so again. Um, am I missing anything? We have a whole bunch of trained teachers here in the room. Am I missing anything? Just... Feel free to raise your hand and tell me if I am. Um, I have worked with people in children's division over the years, and, and I can tell you that I trust them. And every bit of information we can give them to, to help them do their job so that they can care for children is a good thing. And, and the other good thing about what, uh, I was talking to Deb Sutton about this yes, uh, Friday, she was telling me that when it comes to how we respond after the fact, after abuse has stopped, the most important thing for a child is, is how people react to it. Do we treat it as something that's shameful, or do we love the child, listen, and help them cope with it. Right, if it's treated as something that's shameful and, and to be hidden, that, then it can, it's not how bad the abuse was, it's how we, as people around them, uh, love them through it. So, the most important thing seems to me, if you see something out of the ordinary with a child you know, ask. Listen. And if something strikes you odd, come talk to me and we'll figure it out. Any questions about that? Okay. Well, domestic abuse. One adult hurting another in the same household. First, that is, uh, that is the thing that anyone is at greatest risk for, the idea of watching out for strangers. Like, 
both for children and with adults, the person who is, is the highest risk is the person you already know. Like we spend all this time, don't take stranger uh, candy from stranger, stranger danger, the, the image of the white van that whips up and grabs your kid. Like that's not the risk. The risk is the people that the child knows. And it's the same thing for adults. The risk is, is the people that we already know. And um, I started looking into this, like the statistics on this, and something I, I, I have thought before, something I've been asked before, is how often do people make a false report, right? And when it comes to children, it could happen. Like, there are cases where, like, for example, two people are getting a divorce and one accuses the other of child abuse to try to get leverage and it's sort of like a revenge accusation. That can happen with child type of situations. But when it comes to an adult saying that they have been hurt or abused or assaulted, no one's making that up. Like the best numbers I can find, 92 to 98 percent uh, accurate. Like people are not making these accusations up. So if someone says they have been assaulted or hurt or abused and, and it's, a, it's an adult, like it's very rare for someone to be trying to pull a fast one. It is almost always men hurting women, but not always. Not always. And, and what is, we have this story of like, I watch a lot of CSI and, and, and uh, all the various procedurals, like police procedurals. It's the, we, there, we see this image of like the hysterical woman calling the cops who, within the first like hour when something happens and they show up and there's all this physical evidence and that is not at all what happens. It really isn't. Like most often it's long after the fact, it is very calmly reported and there is no evidence anymore when it comes to domestic violence, domestic abuse. Uh, and you might wonder, this is the other thing I've heard the question asked many times, why don't people just leave? Well, that's easy to say if you have your own credit card. It's easy to say if you have your own job. It's easy to say if you believe that uh, it's wrong that you should be hit, but some people don't have, who are in control, who are being controlled, people who are in domestic abuse situations, they're being controlled, uh, money is being controlled, social contact is being controlled, uh, there's the shame of, of speaking up and saying something, and um, the ability of one person to control another, like, Smartphones, aren't these great? I've started seeing, well, yeah, debatably, you're gonna understand why in a second. Uh, we can use these to do cameras so we can watch our kids. And you can control the lock on your, on your home so you can unlock the door for people. Well, that's, from the point of view of someone who, want, who is, wants to have power over another, if you set up a smart lock and you lock someone in their own house, like, be, people don't leave because they can't, right? Um, and there's this, this cycle that happens where something bad happens and they promise to make it better, then it is better for a while, and then something happens again. There's that cycle that, that happens again and again. And so we look for the same thing, type of things you look for when it comes to kids. If you see a, a friend, someone you know, who always is hurt, whose personality changes, uh, constantly checking in with their partner, never has money on hand, skips out on work or school or social outings for no reason, wearing clothing that doesn't fit the season to cause, uh, to cover bruises. Um, you ask, it's the same thing. You just ask. I, I've, you, you go to your friend, you say, this is what I see, what's up, what's up? And you listen. And it's the same thing. You listen and then you can come talk to me and we'll figure out what happens next. Uh, I will tell you that I have walked someone through leaving before and it took a long time because that person, it, it, it took a couple of years um, because that person didn't see how they could leave, didn't see how they, and just to, if you're listening to someone talk about being hurt, uh, if you tell them, well, obviously you just need to leave today, then you're just piling on. You just got to listen and say, this isn't how you should be treated. What can I do to help? Um, and then come find me. Like, we will work through what needs to happen. I will help you through these things. Any questions? Any depressing questions? You can call me Reverend Buzzkill today, sorry.
The reasons we talk about such an uncomfortable topic is so that we can tell the truth about such situations. That they do happen, and that we need to be aware so that we can respond and make sure that everything that can be done is done to protect those whose voices are least likely to be heard. I'd rather go out of my way in these type of situations than have any worry about Jesus saying, well, there's your millstone, right? Uh, no one ever deserves to be hurt, and uh, we need to do what we can to help those who are being hurt. Many of the people who hurt others were, their, were themselves hurt. That's true of the situation I told you about earlier. The child who started stuttering, he was abused by a sibling who had been abused by a parent. Like, there, there's cycles there. And, and when we are able to talk about these things, that isn't the end. People who have been hurt can be healed. Patterns can be broken. But we have to be able to get involved, tell the truth about it, and say, this has got to do, we got to do better. We talk about this because there are those for whom life can be so hard that believing in a God who loves them becomes almost impossible. And for us to respond is to love people in hard situations such that they begin to experience what they have not experienced before. Someone caring about their needs, seeing them as what they are, beloved children of God. The uncomfortable truth is that there are people who are hurting, and it is also true that we are to pay attention called to help and to serve. As a church, we are called to be the place where people can experience patience and hope and love and eventually joy. This church is not perfect, but we follow a perfect Lord who leads us in accepting all and loving all and forgiving all as a gift. This is the good news that we have that there are people here in this county that need to know it. Amen. I invite you to stand with me and join.